Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Good Friday service here at PV. Would you stand with us tonight? Tonight's an opportunity for us to remember the great cost that Jesus paid on our behalf. It's an opportunity for us to stand in awe of the will and love of God and to respond. And I encourage you tonight uh, to allow yourself to to be still in a place of remembrance as we sing, uh, as we worship, and as we hear the word tonight. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betray the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus'
praise and honor unto thee. Praise and honor unto thee. Would you pray with me tonight? Amen. Oh God, we thank you for the ultimate price that you paid. Jesus, that you came willing to take a sinner's place. You took a curse upon yourself. You took a judgment upon yourself, Lord, that you did not deserve. And tonight we stand in awe. We pray, God, that you would come, that your spirit would rest in this place as we pause and reflect on your great love that you displayed so freely and at such great a cost. It's in your name that we pray and that we sing. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross is spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me My living Lord. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. My living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me sing that again then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared 
said the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Jesus, yours is the victory. as we sing this evening. And in this moment, I'm gonna direct us to John 19. This is verse 16 through 30, the telling of Jesus' crucifixion. Then they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews. But that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said, to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Say 
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. thank you. We stand still, God, remembering the final moments of your life and what you gave. And we remember why you gave it, God. Would you be glorified in this place and speak to us? Open our hearts and minds tonight, God. It's in your name that we pray, that we gather. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening. It is so good to be worshiping together tonight. As we prepare to reflect on the truths of Good Friday, I want to make sure you're prepared for an activity that we'll get to partake in later in the service. And so, as you came in, you should have received a little piece of paper. Um, You should have a pen near your seats. And we're going to use that later in the service. So if you did not receive that piece of paper, you need a pen. Uh, Our ushers are going to go ahead and come down. And you just want to make eye contact with them, give them a little wave, and they will get you the materials they need, or you need for the activity at the end of service. One of the most amazing and profound experiences I've ever had in this very worship center came at the funeral of a fireman. The, uh, the fireman was the father of, of a friend of mine, and he had experienced the long and slow decline of terminal cancer. And the funeral, when it was here in the worship center, was packed. There were firemen everywhere, first responders everywhere, and just a ton of people from the community. It's just a profound moment. And during the service, as the uh, pastor that was providing, uh, presiding over the funeral was speaking, he gets to this place where he's starting to share about the hope of the gospel. It's this beautiful moment. 
But then he stops for a second and he looks around and he says, rather than me sharing the hope of the gospel with you, why don't we let our friend do it? The lights go down, it's a quiet moment, and all of a sudden on the screen comes a a video of the fireman. It's a shaky cell phone video. And that fireman is thin and feeble and frail and he's laying on his deathbed in the hospital room. And yet the voice that is coming out of his mouth is sound, it is sure, it is confident. And he proceeds to share but the great hope of the gospel with everyone in the room. He talks about how Jesus paid it all at the cross. How amazing Jesus grace is. That Jesus had done everything at the cross. Nothing was left to be done. It was all finished. And then he closes the video by saying this. If you are watching this, I am already dead. And yet make no mistake, I have never been more fully alive. See, the truths of Good Friday, of Easter, this whole weekend, those were the very bedrock that gave him confidence in the midst of all of his suffering. In the midst of the whole thing, he could have confidence because he knew that Jesus had done everything to pay for the price of his sin at the cross. Jesus' grace was truly amazing. And then after his video, if that wasn't enough, you know, I I was already just pouring forth tears. The service closes by having all these men come out with bagpipes in hand and they begin to play the song Amazing Grace, this haunting, haunting sound. And the truths of the song were just a beautiful reflection of the truths of the whole service. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. You see, the amazing grace of God and the reality of Good Friday were the, again, the key pillars that gave this fireman hope in the face of death. And yet for many of us, we have grown so familiar with the amazing grace of God and the events of Good Friday that we can admit, that really we can miss out on just how amazing these truths are. We can just go through the motions. Some of you can can think back to various years of Good Friday services and Easter services and they all just kind of run together and sometimes we end up going through the motions we miss the beauty of it all. And yet we do so at our own detriment. As our heads go through the motions of Good Friday services and Easter, we can fail to take heart the amazing grace of God on display. And when this happens, we struggle with sin, identity, shame, and we believe the lies of Satan, and we even struggle to believe in our heart of hearts that God actually loves us. Maybe for some of you, that's what you're coming into the service with. You are struggling to believe that God even loves you. You sang those songs, but it was just hallowed to you. Hollow. Meant nothing because you're struggling to know if that God exists or if he actually loves you. When our time tonight, by using the famous hymn, Amazing Grace, by John Newton as our guide, I want us to reflect on the amazing grace of Jesus and the events of Good Friday so that we would quit believing the lies of Satan. We would know our identity in Christ. We would know the freedom that we have in Jesus because he has paid it all at the cross. It was, it was an amazing experience. When I was in England this past month on sabbatical, I actually got to stand in John Newton's very own pulpit at St. Mary's Walnut in London. And the tour guide had me, it was just you know this, this pinnacle moment for me, he had me read the passage that Newton was actually inspired by to write the hymn. And here's I read this passage, you have the lyrics to the great hymn right next to the pulpit just out of, out of this picture. And after I finished, we as a tour group actually sang the hymn together in the church. It was just a sacred experience. This made God's grace seem even, even sweeter. It was amazing. And tonight, by reflecting on God's amazing grace and walking through the scripture in this great hymn, I want us to be able to live unburdened of the sin that Jesus has already covered in full. 
Again, as we walk through scriptures, we walk through the lyrics of this hymn, I want us to learn to resist the lies of Satan and live in our freedom in Christ. In other words, by meditating on the amazing grace of God in Good Friday, I want us to exchange our shame and our sin for the love and grace of God shown in the cross. You see, there's an important truth for us to remember as we think back to the fireman. When that fireman passed away in the hospital room, it actually was not the first time he had died. 2,000 years ago at the cross of Christ, he had died along with Jesus. And believe it or not, if you are a Christian here tonight, you also died with Christ on that cross 2,000 years ago. Galatians 2.20 tells us, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You see, Jesus was not the only one who died on Good Friday. Our old sinful selves and our old rebellious identities died that day. Our shame and our guilt died at Calvary. At the cross, Jesus put an end to the punishment that we deserve for sin and made a way for our dead hearts to be brought to life in him. It's why the sweetest sound in all of the universe, the sweetest sound of grace came from the lips of our Savior at the cross. It is finished. At the cross, Jesus Christ fully, totally, finally, completely, comprehensively, and absolutely paid the price for your sin and mine. Or as Hebrews 10 puts it, Jesus Christ was our one time and once and for all sacrifice for sin. There's nothing left to be done. Nothing more could be added. And in that one sacrificial act, we see an endless supply of grace and mercy offered to all people for all time. Not all of the good works from all of the good people in history could equal the perfect sufficiency of what Christ did for us at the cross. Or as another famous hymn puts it, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. See, many of us, we can remember what it was like to experience and to understand how amazing God's grace was for the very first time. Just like the lyrics of the hymn say, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. But here's the problem. Many of us know these things theologically. Maybe some of you are like, okay, I've heard this a thousand times. But in our daily Christian lives, we haven't consistently felt these truths. We haven't felt them experientially. We know in our heads, but we don't always feel it in our hearts. And if we're honest, we know that Jesus died for our sins, but we act as if our good deeds help seal the deal. If we're honest, we know that God offers us the gift of grace, but we so often try to earn it. And if we're honest, we know that he says he loves us, but so often we live as if we're not sure. We don't live as if it is finished. We live as if there's still more to pay. We live as if there's still more to do to atone for our sin. We live as if grace wasn't grace enough. And we live as if the burden of sin is still ours and God's grace isn't truly amazing. But friends, that is not the truth of Good Friday at all. So let, let, let me make the, the point by giving you an illustration. I want you to picture a chalkboard, one of those old school chalkboards. And imagine that every single time that you sin, a mark or a tick goes on the chalkboard. And many of us, if we're honest, we live our Christian life as if when we accepted Christ, there were all these marks or ticks on the chalkboard, and when we accepted Christ, Jesus wipes the slate of our sin clean. But then, in our daily Christian experience, we go throughout the week and we sin, 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 and then all of a sudden, we come to church, we have a good time of worship, maybe we come to a service like this, and then the slate is wiped clean. But then the next week, you know, we're not perfect, we sin, 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 but we have a really good quiet time. We hear a good song on the radio, and so we wipe the slate clean, Jesus wiped it clean. And then we just keep on going like that. 
And there's a real sense in which you can never possibly get ahead. I mean, yes, Jesus is wiping the slate of your sin clean, but you're never ahead. It's exhausting. You can never keep up. And what happens when you have a a, a bad week or you miss worship or something like that? You can just never get ahead. Maybe that's how you live your Christian life. Well, I want to give you some much better news. At the cross and in our salvation, Jesus does not just wipe the slate of our sin clean. He shatters the slate so that we could never possibly be counted as sinners again. Doesn't matter how many more times you try to tick, there's nothing there because the slate is not just clean, it is gone. When God sees you, he sees everything that Jesus has done for you, not your sin and your shame if you were a Christian. We need to learn to embrace that. We need to learn to embrace that. But here's the deal, as we struggle to to make our way through embracing the truths of Good Friday, what can happen is that we actually forget about God's promises to us because we are so inundated by the lies of Satan. And so what ends up happening in our everyday Christian experience is that we end up believing the words of Satan more than the words of God. Again, maybe that's you coming into this service. You can think about all of the lies he has put forth in your mind and you're struggling to embrace the grace of Jesus. Rather than believing we are children of God, we believe Satan's lie that God still views us as his enemies. Rather than believing that God loves us, we believe Satan's lie that God hates us. Rather than believing that God takes pleasure in us, we believe the lie that God is perpetually disappointed with us. And rather than believing the promises of God, we believe the accusations of Satan against us. But again, friends, it does not have to be this way. When Jesus said, it is finished, he wasn't just referring to the end of the punishment for our sin. When Jesus declared, it is finished, he was also declaring the end of Satan's power and authority in your life and mine. See, one of the primary things that Satan does is to accuse us of our sins before God like a hellish prosecuting attorney. Before we had put our faith in Jesus and received God's amazing grace, Satan actually had real authority in our lives. See, before trusting in Christ, we deserved all of the punishment due to our sin. And so therefore, all of Satan's accusations against us were true. Before receiving God's grace in the gospel, we had no ground to stand upon, no defense against Satan's accusations. But when we put our faith in Christ and received God's amazing, all-sufficient grace secured for us at the cross, Satan's power and authority over your life and mine melted away. All of Satan's authority over our lives was finished at the cross. Now when Satan accuses us before God, it falls on deaf ears. Satan's accusations stand no chance against God's amazing grace because Jesus' blood speaks a better word. Earlier in the service, Chase read from John chapter 19. And that same apostle John, who also wrote the book of Revelation, says in Revelation chapter 12, that Jesus' power and authority through the cross shines forth in ways that we might not actually realize. See, in Revelation chapter 12, we see Satan thrown down from heaven and defeated. And in verses 10 through 11, after Satan's defeat, a loud voice cries out from heaven and says this, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been thrown down. They, this is Christians, conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. See, believe it or not, Your greatest weapon, my greatest weapon in the face of Satan's accusations is your testimony founded upon the blood of the lamb. And I was just reminding our 20-somethings this last night during our Monday Thursday service, there is no such thing as a boring testimony. You may have grown up in church your whole life. You may look at other stories and say, I just have the most boring story. I'm almost embarrassed to share it. That's not true. That's a lie from Satan. 
If we saw someone dead right before us and they rose again to life, we would call it a miracle. That's what happened in your heart and my heart when we came to Christ. Spiritual death to spiritual life. Every single testimony is a miracle. And you can use your testimony in battle against the lies of Satan when you remember the truth of Good Friday that Jesus paid it all for you. The foundation of your testimony. In your testimony, you can say, in your story of Jesus saving you, you can look back and say, on that day, 2,000 years ago, when I died with you, Jesus, you gave me new and eternal life. When you died for me, Jesus, you paid the price for my sin in full. You said, it is finished, and you gave me amazing grace that changed everything. And friends, the day you accepted Christ, all of Satan's power and authority in your life died. And I want you to catch this. The only authority Satan has in your life right now is the wrongful authority you give him when you forget the promises of God. He has no real authority over your life. No longer do you have to live under the lies and dominion of Satan because Jesus' blood speaks a better word. So every single time that Satan comes to you accusing you of your sin, you can remember that God loves you and you can sing along with the saints, the Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures, he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. We have to remember this if we are going to live in light of the freedom that we have in Jesus. If we're gonna withstand the lies of Satan that are put before us. We mentioned the, the book of Revelation once already, but I'm gonna mention again, we've been preaching through this in 20 something since last fall. And so my head's deep in the book of Revelation, which you know, may or may not be a good thing. Sometimes it can be a little crazy. Um, but there are some amazing truths about God in that book. And for me and for, for the rest of the 20s, one of the most striking scenes that we have seen in all the book of Revelation comes in Revelation chapter six and chapter seven. It's this striking scene where in the midst of all of this, God is judging a world that is opposing him. And in the midst of it all, the people who are God's enemies and rebellious against God, people who rejected the grace of Jesus, realize that they actually deserve God's judgment. And rather than face the punishment of God for their sins, they actually cry out to the rocks to crush them so that they don't have to face the wrath of the Lamb. And at the end of this sobering chapter of Revelation 6, there's this haunting question that they cry out. Who can stand before the judgment of God? It is a haunting question. And the question is haunting because in a real sense, no one can stand before the judgment of a holy God. God is holy and we are not. He is perfect and we have rebelled against him. We deserve the punishment of God for our sin and no one in their own power can stand before the judgment of God. And many of us know this. Many of us are coming in tonight, maybe we're Christians, but we still feel the guilt of our sin in just oppressive and immense ways. We know that we deserve the punishment of God for our sin. We know this. Who can stand before the judgment of God? And John knows this. John knows that no one can stand before the judgment of God. And so as he transitions into Revelation chapter seven, seven knowing this, John is expecting to look out and see that no one is standing. No one is standing before the judgment of God. But what he actually sees shocks him. When John looks out, expecting to see no one, what he actually sees is myriads and myriads and myriads of people from every tribe and tongue and nation standing before a holy God. And John is amazed. He's, how, how could they stand? How could anyone stand before the judgment of God? How is it possible? Well, they can stand because they are covered by the blood of the lamb. 
They can stand because Jesus has finished it all and paid for their sin in full at the cross. They can stand because they've received the amazing grace of God. They can stand because their old sinful selves have died and they have a new identity as children of God, adopted sons and daughters of the king. Satan's accusations against them are powerless because Jesus' blood speaks a better word. Friends, if you are here tonight and you are a Christian, this is true of you. You can stand before the judgment of a holy God because of what Jesus did at Good Friday. It doesn't matter how many times Satan hurls these lies in your face, you can stand before God because of Jesus. And again, this is one of the most powerful antidotes against Satan. Think about it, friends. If we can stand before the judgment of God because of Jesus, why do we crumble before lesser and unimportant judgments of Satan, others, and even ourselves? If you're professing an active Christian, who cares how guilty Satan tries to make you feel or your subconscious tries to make you feel if God says that you are accepted? We don't have to believe those lies anymore. Jesus gives us freedom in the cross. Satan has no actual authority in our lives except for the authority we give him when we forget about our identity in Christ. Every single time we question God's love for us, we give Satan authority in our lives he should not have. Jesus is greater than all of your sin. He's greater. I wanna prove it to you this way and I wanna do it in a way that I think is simple but it's gonna ask of you something really uncomfortable. So just bear with me for a second. I want you to think about the sin that you are most ashamed of and most afraid to confess. Bring that sin to mind, as hard as it might be. Think about that sin that you've never told anyone about because you're afraid that even those who love you most would walk away if they knew about it. Think about it. Think about how awful and weighty and terrible that sin is. Think about how much that sin is weighed upon you. Put a weight on your conscience. Think about all the ways that Satan has accused you before God because of that sin. All the ways he's hurled lies at you because of that sin. And I want you to think about all of the times that you've wondered if God could ever love you if he knew about that sin. Think about that for a second. Now I want you to think about this. Believe it or not, Jesus Christ knew every single sin you would ever commit before he went to the cross to die for you, even the sin that you just thought of, and yet he still chose to die for you. That sin that has plagued your conscience for years didn't surprise Jesus. He knew about it before you ever committed it and he still said, I want that child. Nothing you could ever do could surprise Jesus. No sin you could ever possibly commit could surprise him because he paid for it all at the cross. Don't believe the lies of Satan. When Jesus declared it is finished at the cross, He was including the worst sin you have ever committed and the worst sin you could ever commit and will ever commit. At the cross, he paid for it all. Jesus has never loved you more and he will never love you less. And he loved you to the fullest extent at the cross. Think about that. God's grace is truly, truly amazing. Satan heaps all of this shame on us because he knows that it causes us to feel estranged from God. He wants us to feel unworthy of love and belonging because our sin creates a chasm between us and God that makes loving fellowship impossible. But God's grace in the cross on Good Friday is the bridge that welcomes us home to our heavenly Father's open arms. Jesus really did declare the power of sin and Satan in our lives to be finished at the cross. Our old sinful selves died at Calvary. God's amazing grace transforms our lives and gives us a new identity as God's beloved children. And we get to live in that great freedom. Ephesians chapter one, verses three to eight beautifully summarizes everything we've talked about by saying this. 
Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. So just take a second and pause. Think about that. God chose you. He loves you. He loved you before the foundation of the world. He knew every single sin you would ever commit before you ever committed it, and he still chose to love you. No matter how many times Satan tries to tell us that God could never love us because of our sin, we can know Satan is a liar. God loves us in spite of our sin, and he loved us before time began. Let's let's keep going. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished upon us in the beloved one. You and I are children of God. He adopted us. He loves us and he has given us everything. We never have to question his love for us. Never. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. One of the reasons we will spend all of eternity with God is because it will take God all of eternity to lavish all of his love out on us. And even after an eternity of praising God in heaven, we will not have said or sung all of the things we possibly could about God's amazing grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Because of God's amazing grace, you and I get to be children of God. We get to conquer Satan and walk in our new beloved identity in Christ. And because of God's amazing grace and the finished work of Christ, you and I can have hope in all things. And all of this is possible because 2,000 years ago on Good Friday, Jesus declared our sin, our shame, our old wretched and rebellious selves and the power of Satan over us to be finished. And now nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or we could say it with a few less words, as John Newton did. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Let's pray. God, we come before you in awe of your amazing grace. In Jesus, you did what we could never do for ourselves. Thank you for sending Jesus for us. You love us more than we could ever possibly imagine. In the words of the old church father Irenaeus, the son of God became a man so that men could be sons of God. I wanna pray for my friends here tonight. Help them live in light of your amazing grace and the finished work of Christ on the cross. Help them fight the lies of Satan. Help them live in light of your love. God, I also pray for those here tonight who have never accepted your amazing grace in Jesus, who have never given their lives to him in faith. Would you shine in their hearts to give them the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Draw them to yourself by the Holy Spirit that they might see your great love for them at the cross. May they fall in love with you so that they can walk in new life in Christ. Jesus, there is no more beautiful being in all than you. We thank you for your love and grace that you've shown at the cross. Thank you for loving us before we ever loved you. We pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. To close our time together tonight, I want to end by meditating on the amazing grace of God and Good Friday by taking the Lord's Supper together. 
Jesus commanded Christians to take the Lord's Supper so that we could taste and see the grace of God by remembering that Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was spilled for us to put an end to our sin and our shame. And in just a moment, you're actually gonna have the opportunity to come forward to the front of your section and receive the elements of the Lord's Supper and take them back to your seat so that we can take them together. But before we do that, I, I wanna make sure we don't actually go through the motions and just run through the motions of this. See, at the cross, we exchange our sin for the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus. And we are gonna do an antidote here to going through the motions of the Lord's Supper by actually doing an exchange ourselves. And so this is what I had you have the piece of paper for. So if you wanna get out that piece of paper and a pen, I wanna explain the activity here. We wanna make the truths of Good Friday and the Lord's Supper come to life And so here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. This is gonna be uncomfortable, but I pray that God would use this in a profound way in your life. I want you to take a moment while the song is playing over you. We're gonna gonna have a song playing over you. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about that weighty sin that I had you bring to mind earlier. And I want you to write that on a piece of paper. You can cover your hand if you don't want anybody else to see it. I want you to write that sin on the piece of paper. I want you to look at it for a second. I want you to confess it to God. And I want you to crumple it up in the tightest ball you can get it in. And I want you to pray and thank God for his amazing grace. And when you're ready, I want to invite you to come forward to the station, the table closest to your section. And you can put that crumpled ball, that sin, in the black basket on the table. And then grab a Lord's Supper element and return to your seat. And when the song is over, we will then get to take the Lord's Supper together. But I would be remiss if I did not stop at a moment like this after proclaiming the gospel to say that if you are here tonight and you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never made the exchange of your sin for the love of Jesus, I want to give you a moment to reflect. See, this meal, the Lord's Supper, is meant for Christians, people that have received the amazing grace of God, but that can be you. Nothing is stopping you. And so if you feel the pull of the Holy Spirit in your heart tonight, here's my encouragement. Pray and confess your sin to God in your seat. And confess that Jesus is Lord, that he really did die for your sins. He rose again from the dead and that you would give your whole life to him. If you do that, That's what it takes to become a child of God and I would invite you forward to take the Lord's Supper with us for the very first time. If you want someone to pray with, we'll have some friends after the service that would love to pray with you. So take a moment while the song is playing, write the sin on the piece of paper and when you're ready, crumple it up, come forward, put it in the basket, grab the elements and go back to your seat and after the song, I will come up and lead us in taking the Lord's Supper.
as the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, I want to invite you to stand. As we prepare our hearts, we're going to read a responsive reading prepared by our very own creative arts minister, John Mills. So I'll read the leader portion, you read the all portion, and then I will lead us to the elements. God, in kindness, you beckon every guilty, distracted, and hardened heart to yourself. You have always moved toward every sinner who moved towards you. Your bid for our attention is not a stern one, but a gentle one. And this is all of us. Jesus, I hear you calling. Our busyness, our numbness, and our lingering guilt stands in our way. Yet your invitation is for people just like us. Oh, Spirit, quicken our hearts and give us courage to invite you in. Jesus, my door is open. My sin has weighed me down. My back is bent. My shoulders are weighed down. I have caused pain, hurting others and betraying myself. Jesus, your blood was shed for the forgiveness of my sin. We have broken our promises, broken trust, and found ourselves broken. Jesus, your body was broken for me. As your hands were turned over and nailed to the cross, I turn over my hands and see that they're clean. My hands are clean. I am no longer guilty. Jesus, help us up. Look into our eyes and lift up our heads. Jesus, please lift up my head. Restore to us the glory of being your children and your friends. Make us true reflections of the pure light of our creator. I am crowned with glory and honor. Repair what has been marred, restore what has been broken, resurrect what is dead, make us free. I receive your forgiveness and I declare my freedom. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered around the table some of his closest friends. And in doing so, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And next he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you in the new covenant. Take and drink. And in doing so, Jesus gave us a way to taste and see that he is good, to remember the truths of Good Friday. Let's pray. Jesus, you are greater than any other. You are worthy of all of our praise. We thank you for your blood shed for us. We close tonight by echoing in prayer your very words from scripture right back to you, spoken by the Apostle Paul. Jesus, we thank you that even though you were in the form of God, you did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied yourself by taking up the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, Jesus, you humbled yourself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted you and bestowed on you the name that is above every name so that at your, knee, at your name every knee would bow 
in heaven, in on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's remain standing as we close by singing Amazing Grace. God, we thank you for the reminder that's been presented to us in our hearts and minds tonight. As we walk from this place in moments to come, God, would you be with us and would you help us as we choose to pick up your identity and your claim over us and to remember, God, that it is finished. We look forward to celebrating your triumphant rising from the grave this Sunday, Jesus, and we stand in awe of who you are. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Go in peace, Go in peace church.